I heard a story about two young ladies. They were in their early 20s. They were living in California. And they had spent their Christmas day shopping in Mexico. When they returned to their car, one of the girls noticed what seemed to be a little dog. Um, looked, looked just like a chihuahua. Um, it was squirming on the ground in a gutter, and they, they began to have compassion for this cute little dog because it, it looked sick, it looked tired, it, it looked kind of beat up and scratched up. And so they take so they take this little dog and they wrap it in a blanket and they they go and hide it in their car because they've got to cross the border from Mexico back to the United States and and I, and so they hide it in the trunk of the car hoping that customs doesn't see it and they get back to the United States and as they get back to the United States they take out the this little chihuahua and they they try to heat it up and they give it milk and they're really trying to take care of it. They go to sleep and the next morning they wake up again and, and, and the, 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 that, that little dog is worse. It's, better, it's worse than it was. So they, they rush it to the animal clinic headed for the vet, the, the vet and begins to describe all the symptoms. The, do, the, the, the vet's looking at this little dog and goes, where, 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 did, you, where did you get this? And they were a little shamed because well, they didn't want to get in trouble because they knew that they picked it up off the side of the street in Mexico and they were really concerned about getting in trouble. And uh, finally, one of them said, my friend and I found this little chihuahua in a gutter in Mexico. And, and, the, and the vet responded, ma'am, that's no chihuahua. That's a Mexican river rat. <laughs> and to save you a Google search about what that looks like, Check this out. <laughs> Ain't no awe about it. <laughs> Here's the thing. Not everything is as it seems. Not everything is as it seems. In the book of Joshua, the children of Israel had entered into the promised land. And they had just seen the walls of Jericho fall down, which was a great victory. They had defeated armies along the way. God's favor was upon them. But there was a group of people in the land called the Gibeonites. They lived in a neighborhood city and they, they were surrounded by the Israelites. And when they had heard just how powerful and how successful the Israelites were, they didn't want to be destroyed. So they came up with a plan. They loaded their donkeys with old worn out sacks. They put on old clothes and that had holes in them and had sandals uh, that were falling apart. They took wine skins that, had, that, that were cracked and needed to be mended. They had bread that was left out on purpose and it was stale so that it was crusty and old. They, they did this to make themselves look like simply wandering travelers on their way through. They showed up at Joshua's camp and said, Joshua, we've come from a very far away land. We've traveled for months and months. We've tried, we're tired and we're hungry. Please make a peace treaty with us. Let us live here and we will be your servants. Joshua asked, how do I know that you are not from a neighborhood city that I am about to conquer? How can I be sure? that you don't live close by. And they said, Joshua, look at our bread. It was fresh whenever we left. Now it's old and moldy. Our wineskins were new, but now they're cracked and they're falling apart. Look at our clothes. They were dry clean before we left. The, start, the shirt was starched when I left, but I want you to look at it now. Joshua said, let me see the bread. And he takes the bread and he, ooh, ooh, ooh. he sniffs it. It's moldy and it smells terrible and it's bad. And he says, let me see your wineskin. So he picks up the wineskin and it's falling apart as wine leaks out. It looked 
on the surface as if the Gibeonites were telling the truth. Everything on the surface seemed like on the up and the up, like they were straight up people. So Joshua signs a peace treaty with the Gibeonites. Fine, we give you our word. You can live here. We will never hurt you. We will never destroy you. Joshua 9 and 14 says this, Then the men of Israel took some of the provisions, but, but they did not ask counsel of the Lord. They did not ask counsel of the Lord. Three days later, the truth comes out. Joshua found out that they were not who they said that they were. They lived in a neighboring city. The Israelites were ready to destroy them, to wipe them out. But Joshua said, no, don't touch them. We gave them our word. If we break our agreement, then God is going to come after us. It was an issue that could have been avoided. The whole problem was simply that they did not consult the Lord. They just looked at what they saw on the surface. It seemed as if the Gibeonites had traveled a great distance. It seemed like they were worn out and tired. It all made sense. But here's the thing. God can see what you and I cannot see. That's why we need to get him involved before we get involved with other people. Before you sign the contract, before you put money down, before you do what seems to be good, you've got to have something inside of you that says, Lord, what do you think about it? Do yourself a favor and consult with the Lord because people are not always what they seem to be. They may show you one side. People show you the side they want you to see. But God sees the whole thing and so you've got to consult the Lord about it all. How many times do we buy into the excuse, well, it seemed good at the time. It seemed like a good idea in the moment. It felt good. It seemed good. What I saw was good. It looked good. But later down the road we learn it was a mistake. And it wasn't the right decision. Proverbs 14 and 12 reminds us that there is a way. There is a way that seems right to a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. And we have to remind ourselves that not everything is as it seems. Yes, we, are ne we need to get the best information available. Yes, we need to do our homework and we need to make sure that we have all the information to make the best decisions in our lives. I'm all for that. I believe you gather as much good information as possible and you try to make the best decision that you can possibly make. Joshua did the same. He sought wisdom. Joshua did the same. He sought understanding. Joshua did the same. He asked the right questions and look for discernment. Let me see your bread. How do I know you're not from a neighboring city? Let me smell it. Let me taste it. Let me let me see. And all of the senses said that it was a it seemed right. It seemed harmless. It seemed wise. He tried to make a wise decision. But here's the thing about the right decision. Here's the thing about wisdom. Wisdom is like a ladder. The wise man told us in Proverbs chapter 4, 5, and 6, says, get wisdom, get understanding, do not forsake, do not forget, nor turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, and she will preserve you. Love her, and she will keep you. There is power in gathering the right information using the best resources available, asking the right questions in light of my past situations, in light of my present circumstance, in light of the future I want to have, what is the wise thing to do? But 
The wise man does not stop with just talking about getting wisdom and getting understanding. He says this in Proverbs chapter 3 verses 5 and 6. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him and He will direct your path. Wisdom and knowledge is like a ladder that can take you high. But if it's leaned on the wrong wall, can drop you hard. Wisdom separated from God is like leaning the ladder on the wrong wall. When you lean on your own knowledge, you'll eventually fall. When you lean on your own understanding, it will take you high, but it will drop you. Lean not on your own understanding. Joshua didn't fulfill what God told him to conquer because he leaned on what he knew. He leaned on his senses and he consulted not the Lord. Make sure you're leaning on the right wall. Out of the 12 boys in the family, Joseph was his father's favorite. His brothers despised him. Then Joseph heaped coals of hatred on their head when he told him of his, his brothers of his dream. The entire family, father, mother, brothers would someday bow down before him. Up to this point, he was a spoiled brat. Now he's an arrogant spoiled brat. And that's even worse. They entertained thoughts of murder until one day one of the brothers said, Wait, he's not profitable to us if we kill him. Let's sell him. We can make a buck or two. They threw Joseph in a, bit, in a pit until a buyer came along. And finally, after hours of listening to their brother's cry for help, a caravan of Ishmaelites passed by and they sold him for 20 shekels of silver. Ironically, if you think about it, the Ishmaelites were the other side of the family. The offspring of Ishmael. Their grandfather's stepbrother. They never had an eye for things on the same level. So let's sell him to the family members we don't like. That's more painful than killing him. Meanwhile, the brothers knew that they couldn't tell their father the terrible things that they had done. The Ishmaelites would eventually sell Joseph as a slave in Egypt. But his brothers knew that they couldn't tell dad what they had done. So they, they killed a goat. They dipped Joseph's blood in, or coat in blood. They took it to their father and they said, look what we have found. Is this your son's coat? They never said he was dead. They just asked a question. Is this your son's coat? Yes or no? In despair, Jacob begins to weep uncontrollably because the evidence had convinced him that he was dead. The sad part about the story is that Jacob's conclusion is based upon falsified evidence. The, the brothers never actually told them that Jacob, the, uh, tell Jacob that Joseph was dead. They simply showed him the evidence uh, and left it up for him to decide. Uh, but the thing is, is that not everything is as it seems. Uh, and we lean not to our own understanding. Uh, what he should have done, what that father should have done is reach back in his memory and say no, 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 but God gave him a promise. Uh, and if God gave him a promise, how can this thing be? Yeah. Because the promises of God when God gives you a promise, you have to believe that it will come to pass, even when the evidence says otherwise. You see, here's the thing, Westchester Church. It really doesn't matter what anyone else thinks, what anyone else says, what the evidence says. If God gave you a promise, it will come to pass because the promises of God are yes and amen. That which he hath promised, 
He is well able to perform it. You see, some trust in horses and some trust in chariots, but we will remember the name of the Lord. Isaiah asked the question, Who shall believe our report? There's an old song that, that goes like this. It says, Whose report will you believe? We shall believe the report of the Lord. His report says I am healed. His report says I am filled. His report says I am free. His report says victory. Who report will you believe? Every day you wake up and you get to make a decision. Whose report am I going to believe today? Am I going to believe what's in the world or am I going to believe what's in the word? Am I going to believe the voices on TV or am I going to believe the voice I heard in prayer? Whose report will you believe because not everything is as it seems does anybody believe that this morning we love those things I love thinking about the freedom that God provides and I love thinking about the healing that God provides and I love thinking about the spiritual experience that God provides and I want them in my life But how we get to receive them is not as it seems. Because here's the thing about the source of all these things. Jesus is not what he seems. Jesus is not what he seems. Israel thought they were getting a Messiah who would come out of the sky and be a conquering warrior. Instead, they get a baby wrapped in a swaddling cloth laying in a manger in Bethlehem. Ooh, not what it seems. They thought, they thought that he was just going to come in and set up an earthly kingdom. And he said, no, 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 my kingdom's not of this world. Amen. Oh, you thought I was coming to conquer men. No, 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 I'm coming to conquer the heart. Oh, you thought I was coming to set up an earthly kingdom. No, I said, my kingdom is of heaven. Not everything is as it seems. Oh, you thought that you were going to be healed without, a, with, without my sacrifice. Isaiah follows the question, who shall believe our report? He then gives the report. And it's not a flattering report. His prophecy of Jesus, uh, that what he wrote in Isaiah chapter 53 was actually 700 years. 700 years before Jesus. And he wrote, Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we see him, you know, we like to sing, oh, I want to see him look upon his face. There to sing forever of his saving grace. Thank you. But Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 53 and 2, it says, when we see him, there is no beauty. There is no beauty that we should desire him. Oh. Not as it seems. We like beautiful things. We like nice things. And saying there's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrow and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Oh, what a savior. He's not beautiful. He's not esteemed. He's not some royal majesty. No, he's a man of sorrow. He's a man that's despised. He's a man that's rejected. There was no beauty in him. There was, he was despised and rejected and not esteemed. Because here's the thing, not everything is as it seems. Surely, surely, amazingly, Surely he has bore our griefs and carried our sorrows. This 
this unbeautiful. Isaiah is prophesying in this moment about the cross, and he is seeing the cross 700 years before it happened. Uh, and he sees this ugly picture, and he sees all of this, and he's in his heart, he's asking the question who's going to believe this? Who's actually going to believe that this very unbeautiful, very despised, very rejected man is going to carry our griefs and our sorrows. Who is going to believe it? We esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Verse 5 says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace is upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Amen. Jesus is not who he seems. He seemed to his day like just another street preacher. But he was actually the savior of the world. He, As a child he was the kid who sat in the back of the class. And, and whatever people would whisper, nobody really knows who his daddy is. That was who he was, but he's not who he seems. He was, he was the young person. Oh, yeah, that's that. Isn't he the carpenter's son? Not as he seems. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Anything. It's not as it seems. The cross is not what it seemed to be. It seemed to be like another crucifixion, but rather it was the salvation for anyone who believes. Not everything is as it seems. I don't know if I can, I don't, I don't know if I can trust somebody like that. I don't know if I can believe somebody like that. Today, I'm asking you to look beyond what you sense Look beyond what it seems to be. Look beyond what it seems like, uh, what tastes good, what smells good, what your emotions are telling you. Being able to take all of those things, set it aside, and do what Joshua didn't do. Consult the Lord. I'm asking you to go to God for daily direction. You're not going to make the best decisions in your life without consulting God. Don't do as Joshua did and try to figure it out on your own. Don't be like Jacob and believe false information. You get up every morning and you say, God, what is it you want me to do today? I want you to show me today. Let your word be a lamp to my feet. Let your word be a light unto my path. Whatever I'm thinking, God, make sure it lines up with your word today. I want to consult the Lord today. Because not everything is as it seems. And we lean not to our own understanding. When God, when you, whenever you come to God in a spirit of humility, showing your dependence on Him, God can help you navigate your life. But guess what? He expects you to come to Him. You know, I love the lost chapter in the Bible. That Jesus tells the parable about this lost coin. And how they sweep the house to find the coin. And then He tells a parable about a lost sheep about how, how, how the shepherd go, leaves the 99 and he goes and finds the one. I love those stories, but there's a third lost story in there. It's a lost son. Guess what? The woman swept the house in search of the coin. The coin didn't know it was lost. The shepherd leaves and goes and finds the sheep. The sheep was 
lost, but kind of just because it was. It didn't intend to. It just kind of happened. But the son, you know what the father did? Nothing. You never read where the father went out into the world to search for the lost child. Because it was the child's choice to leave. Therefore, it had to be the child's choice to come back. And then there was something inside of him that woke up that said, all right, it's time to come back. And he said, you know what I'm just going to do? I'm Whenever I get there, I'm going to let dad know. I'm just going to be his servant. I'm going to be the lowly servant. And I, he had this great speech prepared. And the father who sees a far way off sees his child come back. He runs to meet him. And this is one of my favorite illustrations. You, there's a good chance if you stick around long enough at Westchester, you'll hear me and see this illustration a lot because I want it ingrained in your memory. Uh, hey, Braden, can you come help me? Thank you. All right. I want you to start there at the end, at the very end. And I want you, I want you to start walking toward me. He sees him afar off. The father, the scriptures are to run to him. He falls to his knees. Fall to your knees. There we go. Uh -huh. I love this kid. <laughs> he falls to his knees. And this is what the father does. The father goes down with him, pushes him down and lays on top of him. I wonder why in the world does the father lay on top of him? The reason why is because the law said, the law said that because of what he did, he, had, he should be stoned. And so everybody else in community gets to be able to get their stones out. And whenever the father lays on top of him, what he's saying is, if you are going to stone him, you're gonna stone me too. you're going to get to him, you're going to get to me because I'm his covering. I will cover him. I will cover him because he made a decision to come back to me and there's a covering over his life and there's a covering that if somebody's going to, they got to get through me first. Thank you. And, but he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just provide a covering. He takes him. And he says, you know what? Here's the, here's the best robe. Yep. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> There's the best robe. And, and, and he said, you know what? Here. It looks like you pawned your, your ring that showed that you were in the family. Probably some random pawn shop somewhere. Here's mine. You're part of the family. You're not just a servant. You're my child. And not only am I going to cover you, but I am going to redeem you back to the place that you were whenever you left. Older brother gets in the mix and goes, oh, well, 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 I don't know if that's fair. Please, guess what? God's not fair. He's not. And he throws this incredible party. And the older brother comes up and he goes, well, well, where's my party at? I've been here. Ask for one. You want a party? Ask for it. I'll throw, I will throw you a party. Because it's not about him leaving and coming back and just being excited. It's about proximity. And what God cares about is just you being in proximity to him. And that's, it's a proximity principle. I promise you, the ha happiest time in the world, I'm going to pick on them a little bit simply because I love them so much, but the happiest time in the world for the Vendus family is whenever every kid is under the same roof. Ryan's thinking about it like, eh, I don't know. Bobby's like, yeah. 
<laughs> Ryan's like, oh, I'm not sure about all that now. <laughs> it's proximity. But here's the thing. He thought that the father was going to treat him a certain way because of the actions of his past. But he did not, did not, everything was as it seemed. The father responded totally different. And sometimes I look at our church, and there's a lot, and you know, I believe that God is going to send us revival of bros, broken and bruised people. And I want to make sure that in our church, there is a spirit of covering and that there is a spirit of restoration when they walk into these doors. They say, you know, it's a place I'm going to be covered. And it's a place that I am going to be restored. And it's a place where God can use me. And it's a place where God can direct my steps. Because here's the thing. We're all broken and we're all bruised and we're all busted. But somebody covered us. Somebody said, whoa, 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 no, no, there's protection here. And somebody said, not only am I going to cover you, I'm going to restore you. Remember, you cannot live off of yesterday's manna. What worked in the past may not work today. Stay open to his voice. Stay connected to him. If I believe that God wants to give you a fresh word. That God wants to give you fresh manna. And I believe and declare that God is going to leave you, lead you down some of the best paths of your life. He's going to protect you. He's going to open doors for you. He's going to bring in right relationship for you. It's, I believe that there are some good things heading your way. But I don't understand the path. I don't understand what I'm on. I don't understand the things that are going on in my life. Uh, that's okay. Not everything is as it seems. Why don't you stand with me this evening, this morning? God is still in control of your life. God is still on the throne. So my question for you today is simply this. Whose report will you believe God what do you want me to do today God what is the best decision I want to consult you in Jesus name in Jesus name as they begin to play and sing as our custom is here at Westchester Church we're going to open up these altars and if there is anything that was said or experienced or felt. We want to make sure that each and every one of you have an opportunity to respond to that. And so jo the scripture said that Joshua consulted not the Lord and that was his, down, his mistake. So today, we're going to give you an opportunity to consult the Lord. Let's pray about our week. Let's pray about our day. Pray about what's on your mind. Pray about somebody that you, that you care deeply about. If you know of a tragedy in someone else's life, pray for them. So these altars are open, and I would like for everybody who's willing to come to the front, lift up their hands, and say, God, I know life is not everything as it seems, but I'm going to trust you. And I'm going to consult you. And I'm going to live for you. And I am going to be with you. Let's 